We take great pride in hosting the larger community for this celebration of humanity and community, this affirmation of dignity and solidarity. 35 consecutive years, we take a time to pause and honor Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s prophetic legacy. It's a time to testify to our commitment to justice, to democracy, and to witness how we strengthen one another through prayer and song and praise. And while the 34 past years have been important, this one's especially important. Because as you know, this year in Jersey City, we're hurting. The African American and the Jewish communities, we've been traumatized. And I'll speak for myself in saying that that trauma feels still quite present. And last month, triggered unfathomable pain stored in both our communities collected DNA. And we know about post-traumatic stress. But I stand here saying that I believe in post-traumatic growth mm. and post-traumatic healing. And we know that singing and praising and learning and praying and eating and schmoozing together is healing. So that's what's on the agenda tonight. Mm. Thank you. 
kind of single-handedly puts this together, and always with good humor. And often with his dog, Omi, right by his side, which is the best, the Honorable Erwin Rosen. Shabbat Shalom to Rabbi Marit and to Cantor Wallach, to the officers and trustees of Temple Beth El, to the choir of St. Paul's Episcopal Church and the Church of the Incarnation, to Reverend Alonzo Perry, to our congregants and to our guests here tonight, Shabbat Shalom and welcome to our honoree, Raj J. Baraka, the mayor of the great city of Newark, New Jersey, who I am privileged to have the opportunity to introduce tonight. Before doing so, though, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of a number of elected officials and community leaders who, are, who have joined with us tonight. We'd certainly like to say welcome to Mayor Stephen Fuller, mayor of the great city of Jersey City, to Congressman Donald Payne, Jr., <laughs> to County Executive Tom DeGees, <laughs> to City Council President Joyce Waterman, Westside Ward Councilman Mira Prince Are, we also have two representatives here tonight, one from the office of Senator Bob Menendez, that is Jillian Berkowitz, and a representative from the office of Senator Cory Booker, Alicia Dunbar. Both senators uh, claim to have something else going on. Uh, there's something in Washington, I don't know, but there's something that kept them from coming, to, coming back to New Jersey. Please forgive me if I uh, don't see you out there, and, uh, you know, and don't call your name, but uh, we, we appreciate everyone who is here to support this terrific event tonight. We are grateful to Mayor Baraka for joining us tonight. His honor is, is one amongst a number of distinguished and dedicated public servants from Essex County who have graced the pulpit in years past of this temple, including the trailblazing icon, Kenneth Gibson, Newark's first African-American mayor, state senators Winona Lippman and Ronald Rice, former Assembly Speaker, now Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver, Newark Mayor Sharp James, Congressman Donald Payne Sr., and of course Congressman Donald Payne Jr., who is with us tonight, and United States Senator Cory Booker. Raj J. Baraka is now in his second term as the 40th Mayor of the City of Newark. His progressive approach to governing has changed Newark's narrative to a city of opportunity. Mayor Baraka has presided over unprecedented growth and investment in Newark while guided by principles of racial, social, environmental, and economic justice to help ensure that the residents of the city of Newark benefit from the growing prosperity. He has built a collaborative effort and culture in which corporations, long-time residents, colleges and universities, public schools, unions, uh, community activists, clergy, nonprofits, law enforcement, and immigrant communities work together for a better newer. Mayor Baraka is a product of the Newark public school system. His family has resided in Newark for over 70 years. He was a career educator in Newark prior to becoming the city's mayor, 
and most recently served as principal of Central High School. His father, the late Amiri Baraka, was a nationally renowned poet and playwright. His mother, Amina Baraka, is a renowned poet as well. Temple Bethel, the Reformed Synagogue of Jersey City, is proud to welcome Newark Mayor Raj J. Baraka on this, the 35th annual Sabbath service dedicated to the memory and vision of Dr. Martin Luther King. Mayor Baraka, welcome. Their inequality is part and parcel of our own. 
We have to really understand what King meant when he said a threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. That we are inextricably tied in the web of mutuality. That in essence, none of us are free unless all of us are. Young Viola Luis Silva, 39 year old, heeded the call of Martin Luther King and headed to Selma from Detroit, a housewife, a mother of five, marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. When the march was over, she drove some folks, Rabbi, to the Montgomery Airport and was murdered on her way back by the members of the KKK. Viola was a white woman, a humanitarian, in the church far away in Detroit, a local organizer whose name is enshrined in the halls of the Civil Rights Museum because she stopped along the Jericho Road and paid the ultimate price so that other Americans could enjoy what she learned all of her life was the promise of this country. For Lamar Smith was shot down on the courthouse lawn in Brookhaven, Mississippi for registering people to vote. For Herbert Lee, who was gunned down by a member of the Mississippi legislature for registering people to vote. For Megan Evers, whose blood stained his wife's lap who was gunned down on his own lawn for registering people to vote. She went there because she wanted to be a good Samaritan and was visited by evil. King was America's conscience. He brought her face to face with this country's schizophrenic relationship with equality. He sought for all of us to be treated by our character, yes, but he also demanded that when we went to America's vaults of democracy and justice that our checks were not marked insufficient funds. Shortly before King was murdered in Memphis, there was a national poll done, a Harris poll. 75% of the people surveyed in the Harris poll had an unfavorable outlook of Martin Luther King. That means that he was more unpopular than Donald Trump. <laughs> Why that may be funny is a real commentary on this country that we live in. The people that are here and the ideas that we support. King is popular now, but he wasn't popular on the eve of his death. You can go to any city in America, you can see a street named after King, a few schools named after King, a couple of holidays that we celebrate, people who gather and congregate in celebration of a man that they despised when he was alive. That's because King favored a guaranteed income for all. He fought for decent and affordable housing for wages. He spoke out against the Vietnam War and talked to two Americans, one where people were allowed to bask in the sunlight of prosperity and the other where millions were isolated on the island of despair. He understood that the same people that rallied against the barbarism of Bull Carter and the outright violence of Jim Crow did not make their way to America's cities to protest the deep and debilitating poverty that crushed generations of hope and dignity. They were willing to sit in to give us the right to eat at any lunch tower, but not challenge a systemic and endemic system that was wrought with racism that wouldn't allow us to earn a living so we could eat at those same lunch counters. They detested the violence of white supremacy and the hatred, but could not find the same passion to address the violence of poor health care, poor housing, poor paying jobs, and the cycle of discrimination that had followed us from the cotton fields of South Carolina to the segregated communities that live in the northern cities of this country. In fact, our struggles are still the same. Our problems still persist. And the king of 1963 would be the king of 1993 and the king of 2003. I guess that's why they said that 91 king would be marching. And while that's a great commentary for king, it's a bad one for us. Our struggles are still the same because there are more African American and men in jail today than were slaves at the height of slavery. The wealth gap between blacks and whites has tripled. In my city, the median income for a household is about $34,000. The median income for a household in Milburn, in St. County, just a few miles away, is over $130,000. King was interested in social promise, but he was also interested in economic promise. Sometimes when I speak about these things, people think I'm a little angry. I must say the days of my being angry are long gone. I'm more focused on how to right wrongs or fix a system that seems to be bent on inequality. But I tell you, I'm not right to be angry. I stand here today only because of a cruel act of history. The only people that came here against their will as property. 
bought and sold on an open market whose humanity was decided in a court case, have the right to be upset because Addie Mae Collins and Carol Robertson and Cynthia Wesley and Denise McNair were killed in a Sunday school in church in 1963. And I'm just as angry that in June of 2015, just four years ago, at Emmanuel AME in South Carolina, the devil showed up again as we worshiped in Sunday school. And I'm equally as angry that here in Jersey City in 2019, five people were killed and two police officers in the pairing of clear act of hatred and anti-Semitism as our children huddled in school and our neighbors in this predominantly black community were trapped in their homes. With a major corridor that runs through what is known as Greenville section of town is a street called Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. And a little further is another street uh, called Kennedy Boulevard. Both gunned down by intractable and persistent hatred that has visited us throughout this history and of this country that we can't seem to escape. I can remember going to homes in the South and seeing pictures of Jesus, Martin Luther King, and John F. Kennedy in that order. <laughs> Maybe we should keep in mind the parable of the Good Samaritan as we journey down life's Jericho Road because sometimes we don't seem to be concerned about anything but ourselves. Nothing is more important than what we're doing. We can't get ourselves to sympathize with anyone else's cause but our own. We need to check our prejudices at the door that block our ability to see clearly to understand if our neighbor's house is on fire, ours may be next. Pastors, we can't always talk about how beautiful heaven is or the rooms God has prepared for us, that the prayer says clearly what we want in heaven we need on earth. People want milk and honey now, they need prosperity now, they have to feed their families now, they have to take care of their children today. We can't just celebrate the, the king of 1963 or celebrate the king of 1968. We have to celebrate the king who gave the speech against Vietnam. We have to celebrate the king who talked about economic inequality. We have to celebrate the king who said that we need a guaranteed income for all. We can't choose the king we like or sanitize the king of history or make king someone that we can appreciate. We have to love king who he was, who he is, and who he represents to all of us. King was our conscience. King spoke vehemently against some of the things that we tolerate today. King spoke against some of the things that we embrace today, that we watch go by today, that we don't have the courage or the mind to step up against. King was against many of the things that we allowed to take place. We have to be concerned, as King was, with other people's conditions, not just our own. And sometimes this feels like a little radical notion, but love is radical. We talk about love like it's milk toast, like it's soft, but love is a radical notion. It's a radical thing. It's the only thing, the only idea that can bring about is the same will change. King was killed because he embraced this radical idea. He believed that you really should treat people the way you want to be treated. He believed the idea of brotherhood that all God's children are created equally and deserve and deserve the right to be treated equally. They deserve freedom and justice and equality. He believed that your character measured who you are and not your rituals or your race. He believed that we all had the duty to see each other through to not allow our natural differences to be the barrier for our greater good. That love is power, a transformative and redemptive power. And sometimes we get this wrong. In fact, most of the time we get it wrong. Love implements the demands of justice. And love corrects everything that stands against it. Let me say that again. Love implements the demands of justice. And love corrects everything that stands against it. We can't say we love and see poverty. We can't say we love and see some of our brothers going without health care. We can't say we love and we see people without homes or that we allow them to live in dilapidated and debilitating circumstances. We can't say we love when we are across the street from pain and hurt and hatred and racism and we don't open our mouth. We can't say we love because love is radical. Love can't exist in the face of hatred. He said that love drives out darkness. We can't say we love because love is not hypocritical. 
You can't say we love and not have the strength to face our fear and keep going. Only love will stare our enemies in the eye and tell us to move forward anyway. Only love will make a mother run in the fire and save her children. Only love forces us to deal with each other, to struggle with each other until right and goodness shows up. Love brings us back to church even after death has, heaped, has been heaped upon us. Love helps us to stare our enemies in the eye. Love. Love, we are all here today because we love something greater than ourselves. We are here today because love is not easy, but it's the only thing that has ever worked. We are here because we love Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and more importantly, because we love what he represented. We're here because we love the ideas that he fought for, and more importantly, we love the ideas that he gave his life for. Love will make you risk everything you have. There's a whole song that talks about what you would do for love. Or when a man loves a woman. <laughs> love will have you out on the road all by yourself in the rain. Wandering in the wilderness. Love will have you marching up. Love, love will take you from Detroit and put you in your car and take you to the airport and get on the plane and get down to Selma and march with strangers to make sure justice comes. Love, love will take you there and love might even get you killed in the process. Love, love, in fact, many people in history and our history love this country enough to give their lives for it. They love democracy enough to give their lives for it. They love this country. They didn't march because they disliked the country. They didn't march because they didn't think the country was great. They didn't organize because they didn't think this country could prosper. They did it because they loved this country. In fact, sometimes they loved it more than themselves. Love is the only thing that's going to change this place. Not hatred, not anger, not mean seriousness, only love. And the love of yourself and the love of who you are. I love this place. That's why I fight for it. Paul Robinson said, when they was telling him to go back to his country, if he didn't love the one he was in, he said, my father was a sharecropper, his father was a slave. And he wasn't going to let any fascist-minded people drive him away from him. That he had just as much claim to America as anybody else. And my father would say, if everybody would go back to where they came from, the airports would be crowded. <laughs> <laughs> and that if we're going to be here, and if we choose this place, and history has chosen this place, whether we like it or not, we are here. And, whether, and if people didn't want us here, they shouldn't have brought us here. <laughs> so we have the obligation to make this place what we think it should be. We have the obligation to build and create a place out of love. We have the obligation to make democracy real. To make it visit, visit every household despite race or color or creed or religion or the person you love. We have an obligation to make America live up to the piece of paper that we learned about in school. We have an obligation to make America be the place that it claims to be to the rest of the world. We have an obligation to do that because we've chosen this place, because God has chosen this place for us, and we have no other place to be but here. And if it means giving your life to make this place more democratic, then so be it. Who are we? to say our lives are more precious than Dr. Martin Luther King. And our struggles are more important than what he gave his life for. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to come here to Jersey City in this time. I want to thank you for inviting me to Temple Bethel. I want to thank you for having the courage to be in this space to talk about a man who is probably the most lied upon, the most misrepresented, the most mischaracterized, 
and the most misunderstood man in the history of this country. That it's difficult to talk about Martin Luther King, particularly in difficult times. We live in difficult times. And the times didn't become difficult by accident. Mm. That these times are difficult because we made them difficult. And we come to grips with that idea, with that fact. That time is not neutral, as King would say. That our actions brought us to this space, to this time in history. That this man is not the president by happenstance. That the events that are going on in this country are not by accident. That there's something growing here that we have to face. And we can no longer turn our heads, bury our face in the sand, pretend things are not going on, go to our own congregation, our own temple, our own mass gym, and not act like something is not happening in this place. We can no longer pretend that the people across the street are going without, that the wealth gap is growing, that wealth is being concentrated in, in fewer and fewer and fewer people's hands, that it's becoming more difficult to make a living here in this country. We can't pretend that everything is all right on Sunday. In fact, we go to church because everything ain't all right. We celebrate because that God, because everything ain't all right. I don't know about you, but I go to church because I need to, not just because I want to. That we go in these buildings and these halls and we ask for God's strength to walk us through the valley of the shadow of death. Not around it, not over it, not under it, but through it. That we ask for his accompaniment as we go through these difficult times. Not that we pray not for difficult times, because difficult times are going to come because our faults create these difficult times. We have to pray that we get through these difficult times with the presence of God, the presence of right, and the presence of good. That's what we pray for, that we're in here. We're not just praying to get along. I'm not here to just get along. Because I don't want to get along with evil. We're not praying just to pretend that we have a relationship. We're praying to get rid of evil. We're praying to get rid of poverty. We're coming together to get rid of hatred. We're coming together to get rid of anti-Semitism. We're coming together to get rid of white supremacy. We're coming together to get rid of inequality. We're coming together to get rid of no health care. To get rid of bad education. We're coming together for those purposes. And if we can't come together on equality, then we shouldn't be coming together at all. When those congregants, when those people came from Temple Bethel in 1968 and made a deliberate and intentional decision to get up and walk down and be with the most unpopular man in America. That says something about those folks in this building in 1968. When they made a conscious and deliberate decision to get up, they were acting like Goodman, Smyrna, and Chains. They were acting like Viola Luisa. They made a decision to get up and join Martin Luther King, the most unpopular man in America, to wrap their arms and their hands and their hearts around him to show him love, to protect him, to say, what you're doing is right, what you're doing is good. I don't know what those other people are saying about you, but once I was blind, now I see. That's what they were saying. And I pray that this is the spirit that we all come together in Jersey City, that we face, that we look eye to eye, and we look injustice in the eye, and it says, says what King would say, that a threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. That we stand together, and we lock arms, and we hold hands, and we march together, not just because we want to be friends, but because we love. We love democracy. We love peace. We love freedom. We love equality. We love a brotherhood. 
We love our sisterhood. We love humanity. And that we'll give our life before those things are destroyed. God's speed and God bless you.